This is Philosophy Bites with me, Nigel Warburton. And me, David Edmonds. If you enjoy Philosophy Bites, please support us. We're currently unfunded and all donations would be gratefully received. For details, go to www.philosophybites.com. Can a racist, sexist, homophobic or other politically incorrect joke be funny? Noel Carroll has built a serious academic reputation thinking about jokes. Noel Carroll, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you. Great to be here again. The topic we're going to focus on is humour and morality. Why is this such an important issue now? Well, probably the topic of humour and morality has been perennial because of the topics that humour deals with, including sex, cleanliness, intelligence. But probably in the last quarter of the 20th century and now in the 21st century, it's become even more pressing as issues of political correctness have come to the fore, pressing both for those who are politically correct and those who are not politically correct. In terms of the latter, many of the leading comics of the day are comics whose topic itself is political correctness. Well, one way out of this would be just to say humour has nothing to do with morality. They're completely separate spheres. It's completely amoral. That certainly is a very well-represented position. I mean, the idea is that, you know, what's said in humour stays in humour. Humour is beyond good and evil. And the immoralist has some reasons for thinking this. For example, if we were to look at various ethnic and racist kinds of humor, the immoralist is likely to point out that the very same stereotypes that are the basis of Irish, Jewish, African-American humor are also the stereotypes that you find being used by Irishmen, by blacks, and by Jews. For example, Irish humor involves a great deal of emphasis on Irish drinking habits. The Irishmen tell the same jokes in a manner of speaking that the English do. (laughs) There's a question there, though, whether just because you happen to be a member of the group at whom the humor is directed, that somehow immunizes yourself against the charge of racism. That's true. An Irishman could tell an Irish joke with hatred in his heart, but very often they're told to elicit a sort of bonding. They express a certain group admiration, cementing a certain camaraderie with, for example, other Irishmen. Similarly, African Americans will tell jokes about voracious sexual appetites, which at the same time that they maybe admit vice are also self-aggrandizing. So what does that show? Well, I think that the immoralist shows that the same joke or the same stereotype has no moral valence. I think it doesn't exactly show that. I think that on some occasions, jokes or the use of various stereotypes are problematic because of the reasons that they're told and the consequences that they are designed to evoke. In the case, say, of the Irish drinking joke, the Irishman tells it with good-natured intentions to encourage camaraderie. The anti-Irishman, or the demeanor of the Irishman, tells it with hate in his heart to underscore something contemptible about the Irish. So you have to make a distinction between the different joke tellings. To just introduce a slight bit of technical jargon, there are joke types and joke tokens. The joke types are the kind of scripts or recipes that one has for telling a joke. Why did the moron stay up all night? He was studying for his blood test. That's the type, and it can be tokened by different people. Some know how to token it successfully in a way that's comically amusing. Others fail, maybe because of timing. It's the joke types that are kind of morally neutral, The joke tokens, on the other hand, are what are moral or immoral in terms of the motive one has for telling it in a certain context. So the amoralist might be right that joke types, that is the recipes, are are beyond good and evil, but the joke tokens or the stereotypical tokens, those are moral or immoral. And by the way, they're also what's funny or not funny, because as we all know, you can tell a joke well, you can deliver a joke recipe well or badly. So there's an analogy here 
with a work of art, that if you simply see a work of art as the physical object so that any exact copy of that physical object has all the artistic properties, then you probably misunderstand contemporary art. If you see the token of the joke as interchangeable, you're missing out on what a joke really is because a joke is something which involves a human being or several human beings performing something for a particular audience at a particular time and there's more than is visible in the transcript of the token at stake here. You're exactly right. I mean, think of a painting and its date is 1748. Then think of that same painting again and now the date on it is 1948. Well, because the painting will, by necessity, have required a different set of intentions if it was in 1748 than it would in 1948, you'll think of it as an entirely different work of art and you'll assess it entirely differently. Well, the same thing applies to the joke in context. The intentions behind the joke in a certain context is what will determine whether or not it's moral or immoral, just as the meaning that you'll attribute to the painting changes in terms of whether you think it was made in 1748 or 1948. Jokes are meant to be funny on the whole. Now, if a joke is racist or sexist or attacks some other identifiable group in a way that is socially disapproved of, what happens if you find that's actually quite a funny joke? Yes, the question does arise as to whether or not you laugh at, let's just be very dramatic and call it evil. Let's suppose that you laugh at an evil joke. Does that show you're an evil person? It's easier to think now about this with a concrete example. Take the old sexist joke, rape is an assault with a friendly weapon. That certainly is a sexist joke. If you laugh at it, does it show you have a bad character? Well, it's certainly very complicated. You might say, look, I only laughed at it because of the word wit, the oxymoronic linking of friendship and weapons and assault. And in fact, it doesn't show that I have a bad character. My left, it doesn't in any way signal that I believe that. After all, I believe it's a bad definition. That's why I laugh. So one has to be very careful about what it would take for laughter at an evil joke to show a bad character. One thing it would have to show is that I endorse certain beliefs that themselves are immoral. Most jokes are narrative fictions, and of course, with fictions we don't believe what is presented in the fiction, we imagine it. And the same is true of all kinds of jokes. Atheists imagine certain things about heaven and God in order to laugh at New Yorker jokes about heaven. Imagination, in other words, as in fiction in general, plays a great deal of importance when it comes to humor. And I may not be laughing at the joke because I believe the joke, or believe what the joke says about women or people of color, I may merely imagine it for the purposes of the joke. That seems to me not necessarily evil. In fact, it's often the case that I am not even required to do that much. All I'm required to do is appreciate the incongruity in the joke. And I can appreciate the incongruity in jokes without bearing ill will towards the butt of jokes. For example, the first time I heard a Newfie joke, Newfie jokes are jokes that Canadians tell about people in Newfoundland. They're really moron jokes. The first time I heard such a joke, I didn't even know what a Newfie was, but I was able to laugh at the joke. The joke went something like this, how can you tell that a Newfie's been using your personal computer? There's white out on the screen. Now, I was able to find that amusing without even knowing what a Newfie was, which I think does establish the fact that there are dimensions of formal wit involved in these jokes that the person who laughs at them can actually claim is the locus of their comic amusement. On the other hand, laughter is a kind of social signal, and we do give off messages in a self-aware manner to other people about what we find funny and collude with them and their laughter. That's true, but again, it becomes very important as to what is being signaled in terms of what's being laughed at. For example, in a lot of black humor, dead baby jokes, for example, the laughter is not being directed at the butt of the joke, the dead baby, 
the laughter is actually being delivered at what we imagine the, the reactions of our more puritanical friends might be, those people who think of babies very sentimentally, how will they react when they hear a riddle like what's brown and gurgles, a baby roast. What we're signaling to each other by laughing at that joke is our, our disdain or our amusement at upsetting the overly sensitive. Some people think that if a joke has a morally obnoxious element to it and depends on that, it just can't be funny anyway. That is enough to undermine it. There can't be funny genocide jokes. There's a strong position to that effect. I think what we've said about what was right about immoralism indicates that that is at least questionable. The strongest moralistic position would be that any joke that contained a taint of evil would not be funny at all. That position seems unsustainable. But there's a more sophisticated position, which has come to be known as ethicism, and it claims that jokes are unfunny to the degree that they're morally blemished, to the degree that there's an immoral dimension to the joke, amusement potential of the joke is diminished. However, the ethicist agrees that there can be humorous dimensions to jokes that have immoral elements. So the ethicist says that a joke might have immoral elements and yet be all things considered funny because of the fact that it has other dimensions that outweigh the moral blemishes, maybe word wit, for example. The ethicist will also say the immoral elements can be so great that they extinguish the funniness altogether. So where do you stand on ethicism? Well, I think ethicism is a highly revisionist position. I think it has a number of problems with it. For example, it only counts the effect of morality in one direction. Immorality can subtract from the humor of the joke. It doesn't give the joke credit for being very moral. In other words, uh, things don't become more funny because they're more right. That seems to me a strange sort of finding. Also, ethicism is based on a pretty sophisticated and perhaps overly slippery argument that's called the merited response argument, and it goes something like this. Humor is a normative concept by which they mean to explain how it is everyone in the room could laugh at something and you say nevertheless justifiably that it's not funny. So it doesn't seem it's a descriptive or a statistical concept. So the ethicist goes on to say, well, in that respect, the response we make to a joke must be merited. It must be worthy of our laughter. And for that, it can't have anything inappropriate about it. Now, the trick here, though, is what do we count as inappropriate? The ethicist builds in morality into the criteria of appropriateness for comic amusement. Those of us who aren't ethicists would claim that's what the ethicists should be proving. We don't normally think that moral appropriateness is a criteria for comic amusement. For example, we accept moral incongruities to serve as the basis of humor. So you seem to be moving back to the amoralist position here. You seem to be saying that humor and morality are separate spheres and don't get them muddled up. Well, I'd like to find a position really between the amoralist and the, and the ethicist. I'd like to argue that sometimes moral blemishes can, in fact, render a joke unfunny or not amusing. So in that respect, I'm opposed to both of those positions. I'm opposed to the amoralist because I'm, of course, denying that moral blemishes are never relevant to humor. But I'm also less demanding than the ethicist because I'm not saying that every moral blemish is to the detriment of humor. I'm only claiming that sometimes something can be immoral and that immorality can undercut the humorousness of the joke. And this follows really from the argument that what we should be focusing on are humor tokens, the intentions in context that the joke is told for. Because sometimes given those intentions, the joke can be immoral, the audience can perceive it to be immoral, and for that reason, the audience will refuse to accept the humor contract. 
In other words, they're being asked to imagine something, but they're being asked to imagine something they resist. Take this possible specimen of humor. You can put in any disadvantaged group that you want. Why is X not allowed to swim in the Thames? because they'll leave a ring around the harbor. Now, this joke could be told for the purpose of disparaging a particular ethnic group, a way of saying these people are are really unclean or savage. That joke told with that intent about a specific group can be something that the morally sensitive audience member simply won't accept. And at that point, the joke won't be funny. In order to find a joke to be funny, You both have to understand it, and you have to take some pleasure from it. In many cases where the intent in context is to harm, the morally sensitive audience may understand it, but for the very reason that it understands it, refuse to take pleasure in it, and at that point the joke will fail. I can imagine someone listening to this who listens to a lot of comedians and thinking, well... We're going to end up with something very moralistic here. We're going to end up with humour that's lost its edge. We're going to have these alternative comedians who are so politically correct. And it's just going to be dry. It's not going to be humour at all. It's going to be something like a moral re-education class. Well, I don't have that fear because uh, the mode of communication that comics have involves all sorts of things, their background character. Most of the time, we have some take on where the comic is coming from. Then, of course, there are all kinds of behavioral and gestural features that the comic has and uh, the comic's tone of voice. And in some cases, even the comic's costume and way that he or she presents herself. All of those things are resources the comic has that when handling this particularly sensitive material enables the comic to strike an ironic or distanced mode in ways that allows the comic to explore that material and maybe even redirect the laughter. And as long as that possibility is open, it seems we can have our cake and eat it. We can have an appreciation of the fact that sometimes certain material and the attitudes connected to it will neutralize and even demolish comic amusement. And nevertheless, there would be comic strategies that enable that material to be handled in a more sophisticated way such that it remains viable. So do you have an example of something that is actually funny, even though the content is very close to the mark and uh, considered bad taste? It often occurs in episodes of Curb Your Enthusiasm by Larry David, who I think is a master of this. Let me give you two quick examples. One is that after the Hurricane Katrina, Larry's wife, Cheryl, has decided to adopt a family from New Orleans. Larry goes to the airport and meets them. They introduce themselves, and their name is Black. And he relentlessly returns to the subject saying, well, your name is Black. That would be as if my name were Larry Jew. Another is at a Passover Seder at Larry's, an actual Holocaust survivor arrives. But also the rabbi who comes brings with him a winning contestant from the television program survivor and the two of them get into an argument about which of them is really a survivor both these cases you find that the humor while getting very very close to unseemly morally so is effective in the first case because of Larry's relentlessness but in the second case because of the way in which Larry is pointing to the fact that within our culture, Holocaust survivors are able to dine out on that. Noah Carroll, thank you very much. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. For more Philosophy Bites, go to www.philosophybites.com. You can also find details there of Philosophy Bites books and how to support us.